Hall, Corey Bieber, Executive Advisor. Please go ahead, Mr. Bieber. Thank you, Operator, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our second quarter 2020 conference call. With, the, with me this morning are Tim McKay, our President, and Mark Stainthorpe, our Chief Financial Officer. Before we begin, I would refer you to the special note regarding non-GAAP measures contained in our press release. These measures used to evaluate the company's performance should not be considered to be more meaningful than those determined in accordance with IFRS. I would also like to refer you to the comments regarding forward-looking statements contained in our press release and also note that all amounts are in Canadian dollars and production and reserves are expressed as before royalties unless otherwise noted. With that, I'll now pass the call over to Tim McKay. Thank you, Corey. Good morning, everyone. Canadian Natural delivered top-tier operational results in the second quarter as we have robust, long-life, low-decline assets, operational excellence, capital discipline, and the ability to enhance our margins, which delivers sustainable cash flow. The strengths of Canadian Natural's business model are also implied to environmental, social, and governance to deliver industry-leaving performance across the board, a significant factor in our long-term sustainability. And when it comes to environmental performance, Canada leads the world. Canadian Natural and indeed the Canadian oil and gas sector has delivered game-changing environmental performance. For instance, Canadian Natural has already reduced our overall corporate emission intensity by 30% since 2012. And at Horizon, our intensity is down 38%. And with our leading, we are a leading capture and sequester of CO2 in the oil and gas sector worldwide. In just these areas, Canadian Natural has taken the equivalent of over 2 million cars off the road, equivalent to 5% of the entire vehicles in Canada. And that is just what Canadian Natural has done. The entire industry has achieved similar, equally impressive results. In our oil sands operation, we can develop technologies, and by using Canadian ingenuity, we can even do better, moving closer to Canadian Natural's aspirational goal of reaching net zero emissions. Canadian Natural has multiple pathways to achieve net zero, with the actions identified in the near, mid, and long term, and the strength of the Canadian oil sands mining asset with its long life, no decline, and its manufacturing-like operations it can have one of the clearest, if not the clearest route, to net zero of any global oil asset. Canadian Natural had a very strong operational results as we achieved quarterly production of 1.165 million BUEs per day, with natural gas production of 1.46 BCF per day, and liquids production of 922,000 barrels per day. During the quarter, we effectively and efficiently reacted to temporary curtail production, complete maintenance, due to low prices, while prioritizing high margin production. Then, as prices improved, we quickly reinstated production, cost effectively. Starting with natural gas, overall Q2 production was 1.462 BCF per day, an increase from our Q1 production of 1.44, with North American Q2 natural gas at 1.431 BCF per day, up from Q1 of 1.407. BCF per day as we started to execute our plan to add 60 million cubic feet per day of natural gas volumes at less than $3,000 per BUED. We continue to focus on operational excellence and our Q2 North American natural gas operating cost was very strong at $1.11 per MCF versus Q1 of $1.24 per MCF. In the second quarter, Canadian Natural realized a corporate natural gas price of $2.03 per MCF as a result of our diversified natural gas sales portfolio, of which 49% is used within operations, 32% exported, and 19% is exposed to eco pricing. Our Q2 North American light oil and NGL production was 82,422 barrels a day, down by seven, approximately 7%, 7 primarily due to the company's decision to temporary contour production and reduce well servicing activities in the second quarter. Q2 operating costs decreased to $14.41 per barrel versus Q1 operating costs of $15.99 per barrel. Overall, our international assets had a strong Q2 with oil production approximately 44,000 barrels a day, which is comparable to Q1. Offshore Africa production was 17,444 barrels, 
up when compared to Q1 of approximately 16,000, as expected due to the planned maintenance program completed in Q1, offset by natural fuel declines. CDI operating costs in Q2 were strong at $7.67 U.S. per barrel versus Q1 of $8.83 U.S. per barrel. In the North Sea, production averaged 26,627 barrels a day in Q2, down from Q1 of 27,755, primarily due to natural field declines, with, with strong operating costs of 28.47 per barrel, a reduction compared to a Q1 operating costs of 29.73 per barrel. In South Africa, the operator is moving the rig and is targeted to spud the expiration well in Q3 of 2020. And contingent on results, an additional expiration well could be drilled on the block. Q2 heavy oil production was reduced to approximately 62,500 barrels per day in the quarter. And versus 88,100 in Q1 as we temporarily curtailed production and reduced well servicing activities related to the low pricing in the quarter. Q2 operating costs decreased to 17.97 per barrel from the Q1 operating costs of 18.68 per barrel, reflecting the company's focus on cost control. A key component of our long life low decline assets is our world class Pelican pool where leading edge polymer flood continues to deliver significant value. Second quarter production was 55,731 barrels a day, down from the first pro quarter of 57,986, primarily as a result of reduced well servicing activities in the quarter. Operating costs continue to be very strong at 631 per barrel versus Q1 operating costs of 618 per barrel. At Pelican, our team continues to drive operational excellence, and with our low decline and very low operating costs, Pelican continues to have an excellent setback. Our second quarter thermal production was 212,807 barrels per day, down from the Q1 of approximately 228,000. Operating costs in Q2 were 1013 per barrel versus Q1 operating costs of 1102. During the quarter, planned maintenance was conducted at Jackfish. As well, in our thermal production areas, we temporarily curtailed production in the quarter as a result of the low prices in May. In the second quarter, in the Kirby area, Production was approximately 56,000 barrels a day, which includes both Kirby North and Kirby South. The Kirby North ramp up is ahead of schedule and for the month of July, averaging approximately 43,200 barrels a day, approximately 8% higher than the nameplate capacity of 40,000 barrels a day. A great result by our team. At our oil sands mining operations, we had an outstanding second quarter with record production of 464,318 barrels a day, inclusive of the horizon maintenance in May, with record low quarterly operating costs of 1774 per barrel of SEO. Our teams continue to capture synergies between the two sites, leveraging technical expertise, services, operating efficiencies, driving our costs down with consistency. With year-over-year -year hard dollar costs, excluding fuel, down approximately $96 million in the first six months on an unadjusted basis as compared to 2019. Our teams are very focused on driving operational excellence. As well, as part of the company's overall strategy to maximize value and enhance margins, during June, we were able to test the Albion's mine capability, in which we had an average test rate of approximately 339,000 barrels a day in that period. With the Scottford upgrader targeting to increase capacity to approximately 320,000 barrels a day in Q3 of this year, we are confident we can feel the extra capacity. This additional capacity at ASOP will allow us increased flexibility, margin improvements, and will be managed through the company's curtailment optimization strategy. Work on the commercial engineering for IPEP continues while the field pilot testing is temporarily delayed as we reduce people on our sites due to COVID-19 and we only will continue to pilot when it's safe to do so. I will now turn it over to Mark for the financial review. Thanks, Tim. The second quarter demonstrated the advantages of having a low cost structure and a unique portfolio of assets with low decline when navigating the low commodity price cycle. Adjusted funds flow was 415 million in the quarter, effectively covering capital expenditures, which were 50% below Q120 levels at 421 million in the second quarter. In addition, we stored a higher portion of our oil sands mining SCO and international light crude oil 
in the low commodity price quarter. The estimated increase in adjusted funds flow would have been approximately $60 million in the quarter had those barrels been sold in June. Liquidity remains strong at the end of Q2, with total availability on our bank lines and cash of $4.1 billion. In the quarter, we increased our $750 million term facility to a billion and extended the maturity to 2022, and we retired as scheduled $163 million of our $3.25 billion facility and a $900 million Canadian medium-term note. Because of our operational excellence and solid financial position, we were able to be patient and prudent and obtained attractive pricing when raising a total of 1.1 U.S. million of notes in the quarter, consisting of U.S. 600 million of five-year 2.05 coupon and U.S. 500 million of 10-year 2.95 coupon bonds. Net debt at the end of the quarter was 22.8 billion, with debt-to-book capital of just over 41 percent, well below our bank covenant and within the company targeted range of 25 to 45 percent. With our low maintenance capital program of 2.7 billion and the ability to keep production flat. We target significant free cash flow in the second half of the year at current strip pricing, which, result, which would result in ending 2020 debt being flat to down from ending 2019 levels. Our long life, low decline assets and effective and efficient operations gives us the ability to sustain returns to shareholders over the long term. In March, we increased the dividend 13%, which is the 20th consecutive year of dividend increases. And due to our ability to generate sustainable cash flow, we maintain the dividend through the low commodity price cycle. Our culture of continuous improvement, our ability to be effective and efficient, and the relentless focus at Canadian Natural in controlling our costs led to the solid financial results in a very challenging and volatile commodity price environment. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Tim. Thank you, Mark. Canadian Natural's ability to deliver sustainable cash flow is driven by our effective and efficient operations, our high quality long life, low decline assets that have low maintenance capital and significant reserves that are resilient in a volatile pricing environment. As WTI prices improve, there is even more upside for our shareholders as at strip pricing, we are targeting significant free cash in the second half of 2020. Canadian Natural is focused on continuous improvement and we continue to find opportunities to drive our costs down and are working with our service providers and for 2020, are targeting significant savings of approximately $745 million. As a result of our effective and efficient operations, the quality of our assets, we have a low free cash break even, including all capital expenditures plus current dividend of approximately 30 to 31 US per barrel. Canadian Natural continues to take a proactive and effective steps to ensure the health and safety of the people working for us, and we will continue to enhance our COVID-19 pro program across the company as well as our safety performance. As I talked earlier, Canadian Natural is on track to achieve our environmental targets, lowering our GHG intensity. And as we achieve that target, we will set our next target and will continue to lower intensity as we work towards our aspirational goal of net zero in the oil sands. In summary, we will continue to focus on safe, reliable operations reducing our GHG intensity and enhancing our top tier operation. Canadian Natural is delivering top tier cash flow generation and with our $2.7 billion capital forecast, we are keeping production stable. We are a unique, sustainable, robust and clearly demonstrated ability to deliver returns to shareables by balancing our four pillars. That concludes our Q2 call. I will now open the line for questions. And at this time, we will now take questions. To ask a question, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound or hash key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from Greg Party from RBC Capital Markets. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. Good morning. A um, couple questions, but maybe the first one is, is just on Horizon AOSP. Um, you mentioned 320,000 at the upgrader um, in the third quarter. Is that capacity? So should we be sorry? How should we be thinking maybe of, of, of the ongoing capacity on the upgrader? And then just the mirror image of that is: is, is are we now talking maybe a 17, 18 dollar kind of opex uh, run rate at, at Horizon AOSP? Yeah. So the first question with the the ASOP. So. The, the expansion 
uh, is really for the front end. Um, obviously, uh, we're not the operator of the upgrader, uh, but when they're completing their complete their turnaround, uh, uh, the capacity is going to be at the 320,000 range. So, uh, what we'll do is, uh, is ramp it up and and see how uh, how well it uh, runs in terms of that 320,000. So, um, the good part is we have excess capacity to be able to uh, fill it and uh, keep it full. Um, on Horizon, I would say, uh, you know, a sub-19 is, is not a bad uh, number. Uh, our, guys, our teams are really doing a, an excellent job in terms of, uh, um, of both um, finding enhancements to the operation so that we can increase the reliability, uh, get a little extra capacity from time to time, as well as uh, finding operating cost improvements. Okay, and, and, and just related to that, a lot of turnaround activity um in the oil sands this year, does that really negate a big turnaround next year? Uh, no. Actually, uh, a part of it, uh, we have uh, the East Tank uh, expansion that uh, we are doing in Horizon. It's still on track. So when we do that work, uh, we will be taking an outage in early spring uh, to complete that work. So uh, we're doing what I would call a, a relatively small one this year with a little bit bigger one into next year when the expansion piece is ready. Okay, and, and last one for me, just shifting gears, is um, you know pretty large working capital draw over about a billion dollars. I'm just wondering, Mark, can you uh, give us an idea maybe of, of the components of that and then um, reversal and or how much does that really figure into the to the debt calc as you're thinking about it? Yeah, sure, Greg. And, you know, as you know, the working capital generally is a timing thing. There's two kind of bigger components. One, of course, is the receivables. When you come out of March and into June, you had uh, certainly different forecast pricing. So when you get paid the next month, you have uh, you have that draw or that increase in receivables. The other notable one, though, is the draw in payables. So that, I think, reflects a little bit about how uh, the costs are coming down and, and the capitals come down. So you may not see that reversal there as we continue to control costs. Uh, I guess the last thing to consider going into Q3, though, is turnaround. So we are doing turnaround, so there will be more, uh, you know, capital and things like that to go along with that. Okay. Terrific. Thanks very much. Your next question comes from Neil Mehta from Goldman Sachs. Thanks, thanks, team. And, and strong operational quarter here. Um, I just wanted you guys to, to expand a little bit more on the comments in the release where you said your your net debt will be flat at 2019 uh, year-end levels by the end of the year at the forward strip. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the assumptions that are going into that pricing um, uh, thoughts on capital capital, and uh, yeah, I think you talked a little bit about the working capital side because it, it would imply a very robust free cash flow uh, ramp up in the back half of the year. Yeah, I mean that's, that's kind of a forecast at strip pricing, to, so taking strip WTI and and, you know, it's hard to do strip differential, so we're taking a sort of normalized differential over time um, just because it's so illiquid in the back half uh, to really get a strip differential. Um, and same with uh, uh, strip uh, FX. So you do actually have an FX uh, draw on that compared to 2019 ending levels. But I think it really, Neil, just speaks to the uh, sustainability, the free cash flow capability uh, of the assets because of that low decline and low capital requirements. And, uh you know, as Tim mentioned, we're on track for the $2.7 billion of, of capital in 2020, so that makes its way through in the second half. But really, it's, it's, it's about uh, prices here stabilizing a little bit higher and WTI in the sort of uh, $41 range. That gives us that, that free cash flow in the second half. Yeah, very, very clear. Uh, the follow-up is just on 2021 capital spending. I think on the last call you indicated an early look at you know, prices stayed depressed, it would be plus minus $3 billion. Obviously, the curve has firmed up nicely here for 21. So any flavor for how we should think about spend? And what do you define um, as, as sustaining CapEx now that we've gone through a couple more months of this down cycle? Yeah, Neil, it's Tim McKay here. Um, really, I, you know, what we've seen this last year is, is that there's uh, a huge volatility, a huge um, uh, uh, change, shall we say, with the uh, demand. Um, and so I think uh, right now it's really too early to uh, to really speculate. In the fall here, we'll go through our process of, of going through all the different projects we have as well as uh, 
uh, decide kind of what our capex is. Uh, um, you know, do I see it changing significantly based on the strip pricing today? Maybe not, uh, but it's really too early. I think uh, we'll go through our process. Uh, we'll uh, make that decision later on uh, um, with the board. But when, in just a, Tim, there's a clarification when you say see it changing significantly, you mean changing significantly from 2020 level? Yeah, exactly. Like if, if we're in the, the three billion range, um, that would probably be about the, a number in there. But uh, it's just really t too early to say. Uh, it's uh, uh, we'll just go through our process and and uh, uh, look at it here. Because it's uh, as we've seen this last year. Um, obviously, we started off with a four billion dollar uh, budget, and that reduced to uh, you know two point seven very quickly. And you know we were able to do that, uh, keeping our production flat. And so when we look into uh, next year, we'll go through our normal process and, and uh, evaluate uh, uh, what opportunities we have ahead of us and what makes best for the company at that time. Will you be doing an open house in November again? I guess that will be have to be virtual to the extent you are. Yes. Um, I, we really haven't uh, talked about that at this time, but I would suspect we would. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Your next question comes from Isit Sen from Bank of America. Thanks. Good morning. Um, looks like um, you have committed 10,000 barrels a day of uh, the targeted 50,000 barrels a day Keystone optimization expansion that becomes available in 2021. Just wondering if you could talk about uh, similar opportunities that might become available. Looks like Keystone has received U.S. permits to increase exports. Just wondering if you could um, talk about your thoughts on that. Um, well, all I can say is that, uh, that, that approximately the 10,000 barrels a day, uh, obviously we're looking forward to getting access to that uh, as soon as possible. Um, our understanding is that uh, they are trying to do that uh, as quickly and prudently as possible. The incremental barrels, uh, I suspect they'll go to some kind of open season, but uh, um, really that would be a question for TC to uh, to uh, answer. Got it. And, and Tim, just to follow up on that, uh, pipelines have been in the news lately, um, running into all kinds of regulatory issues. How are you thinking about broadly your risk uh, takeaway, uh, risk mitigation strategy? Um, any thoughts on that, given the new environment? Well, Canadian Natural has been very supportive to uh, all different pipeline projects. So uh, whether it's a Keystone base expansion, the Keystone expansion, uh, we've committed 200,000 barrels a day there. Uh, TMX, we've got 94,000 barrels a day there. So um, we have um, a numerous or a number of opportunities there for uh, for uh, diversifying our, our pipeline piece. Uh, you know, uh, my understanding with uh, Trans Mountain, it, this construction is going very well, and uh, they're on track for that December 2022. So today I feel pretty positive uh, TMX will be a good stepping stone. Uh, it looks like very strong to be completed and it, you know completed uh, essentially on time. So uh, that part I feel very comfortable about. On the Keystone, uh, it's obviously uh, a very uh, interesting and in, in that uh, it is changing you know almost daily. So I really couldn't comment uh, really on the Keystone one. Great. And Mark, just to follow up on your earlier uh, answer, uh, net debt um, year end 2020 uh, being flat year over year is unique among global energy peers. Um, you've always talked about the four pillars. Is this now a new strategic goal in this environment, not let um, net debt rise in any scenario? Well, I think, you know, when we look at the four pillars, those are still uh, sort of fundamental to how we allocate capital and cash flow. Uh, what you have seen in the in 2020, of course, is the suspension of the buyback program for now, um, as you know the free cash flow is going to the balance sheet, and and you know that that has been sort of the case. Uh, also, of course, when you look at the return to shareholder pillar, uh, we've been able to maintain our dividend uh, through the, the price cycle. We increased it here in March, 13 uh, percent. And again, I think that's a reflection of the low cost structure of the asset base, the low decline nature that is able to sustain cash flow and free cash flow through the commodity price cycles. Thank you. Your next question comes from Joe Gimino from Morningstar. 
Thank you. How, how are you thinking about DAPL and the east leg of, nine, of line five as it may uh, relate to some of the egress capacity for your production? Thank you. Yeah, the, well, I guess, uh, pipelines are always uh, uh, interesting uh, in the news. Obviously, uh, DAPL and uh, the, the line five are um, changing uh, very rapidly, day to day, month to month. Um, you know, obviously, you know, they are in service, they are very reliable, uh, so, you know, we feel comfortable. Um, we don't believe there will be, well, the DAPL has very little impact on us. Um, you know, when you look at uh, the declines that are happening in the basin, whether it's in, the, in North Dakota or uh, in Canada, uh, I don't think uh, the DAPL will be really of a, any um, uh, significance by the time, uh, you know, if, if something was to go there. But uh, um, the line five, you know, again, we feel very comfortable with, uh, with what Enbridge is doing there and, and uh, you know, everything we've heard from Enbridge is, is all always very positive. Thank you. Your next question comes from Phil Gresh from J.P. Morgan. Yes, hi, good morning. A um, couple of very quick follow-up questions for you. First is just on uh, the oil sands mining segment. Um, I know it was already asked about uh, AOSP, but just overall the oil sands mining business at 464,000 barrels a day of, of production this quarter. So taking into account that performance and the capacity uh, increase uh, at AOSP, just in general, as you look ahead to say 2021 on an annualized basis, how do you think about the total uh, capacity or production potential across both assets with that kind of performance? Yeah, the, it, it is increasing um, incrementally. Um, you know, but it, 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 you know, for I look at looking ahead into next year, um, you know, we got a bigger outage on uh, on horizon, so you know that piece could be uh, relatively flat year over year. In terms of volume, uh, ASOP, uh, with the work they're doing this year, they've delayed the further piece to uh, to the plant until 2022. So I suspect ASOP will actually be up year over year. But uh, um, you know, uh, the, these are uh, great assets. Uh, our teams are very focused on finding those opportunities to uh, do small increment gains across the there. So you know. Our capability is uh, increasing, and our reliability, I think, is 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 quite high and very top tier. So, you know, there is uh, a little bit of opportunity there, but uh, uh, our teams are really uh, really doing a great job in terms of uh, finding those uh, those opportunities. Yeah, I guess if, if I were to think of TQ as as a new run rate when there's when there's not maintenance, um, is is that a reasonable way to look at things? Um, yeah, when you really look at uh, the Q2, it really, what it really showed is uh, how well our teams can run uh, run the facilities. Uh, you know, we did do the, the pigging maintenance uh, at Horizon in May. So when you mm -hmm. account for that, uh, it, it's, it was a fantastic quarter. Uh, obviously, you know, once you do it once, you'll do it again, and that's that's what our goal would be is to uh, to uh, make it closer to that uh, uh, when we don't have maintenance every quarter. Right. Okay. Um, just one more debt question. Um, uh, sometimes you guys will give a leverage ratio target as well uh, for year end, and I obviously you gave the, the net debt aspect of that. Uh, I'm just curious if there's a specific ratio you're thinking that that would imply. Well, I think you know we it would imp it would imply a higher uh, leverage ratio than 2019, just based on uh, commodity prices in in 2020. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, it seems like sub four times, but uh, yeah. Just yeah, it would be, yeah, for sure. For sure it would be sub four times, so. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. You bet, thanks. Your next question comes from Manav Gupta from Credit Suisse. Um, hey guys, wanted a outlook from the WCS differential. Uh, it's been widening a little here. Uh, just wanted to your thoughts on into year end, and I think on last conference call you talked about uh, apportionments being very low, and you were spot on. So, if you could tag that and give us your near term outlook on the apportionments on the pipelines, also. Sure, uh, it's Tim McKay here. Um, so, uh, you know, apportionment, uh, 
you know, when we look ahead here, um, you know, between uh, uh, the maintenance and, uh, um, you know, uh, what's come off the market here, uh, you know, we believe that apportionment uh, will be uh, relatively low uh, going into uh, the third quarter. Uh, fourth quarter, again, it will it'll probably depend on mostly on the, the pricing uh, situation at that time. But it, uh, Q4 could be similar, maybe a little higher in terms of apportionment as the turnarounds uh, are completed uh, in the various areas. So um, as far as WCS, uh, I mean, it's 22% today. Uh, you know, it, um, it's, you know, always, uh, it's an illiquid market. Um, you know, we think that, you know, anywhere from that 22 to 30 is probably the right range for the third, fourth quarter. But uh, again, uh, part of it's going to really depend on, on the pricing and what comes back on in the market here. But, uh, um, you know, we feel very confident that the apportionment, at least for the third quarter, will be quite low and towards the end of the year it might increase a bit. A quick follow-up, you are doing some turnaround on the horizon in OSP side. Should we assume that third quarter we should see an increase from jackfish and some of your other heavy production to offset the, the turnaround at horizon in OSP? Yes, exactly. You'll see that uh, we'll flex our thermal muscle in terms of uh, increase in that production and uh, ramping up at primrose and jackfish and, uh, um, and then uh, obviously uh, as we come off the turnarounds at both the SOP and Horizon, uh, they will decrease. Thank you so much for taking my questions. You're welcome. Thank you. Your next question comes from Amir Arif from Cormark Securities. There are Amir. Six, um, yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thanks. Just a couple of quick questions for you. Just on on the gas side, just given the, st the strength we're seeing in the 21 strip, just curious how much more uh, productive ads you could you have in your inventory in terms of at the low uh, capital efficiencies that you're talking about in terms of 3,000 uh, per following. Well, the the obviously the 3,000 uh, dollars per VVD were the kind of the the, the cream opportunities. Obviously. Uh, we have more opportunities probably between that $3,000 and $5,000 uh, uh, per VOD. Um, and, you know, we always find other opportunities uh, within our portfolio that uh, our teams, uh, uh, when they look through the properties, find those other opportunities. So uh, it's, it's kind of a continuous improvement process. Uh, there will be more. We always find more. Um, you know, I would not... Uh, I would not, wouldn't want to say how much more today, but uh, um, they are always working and improving. So uh, all I can say is it's always more, not less. Okay, sounds good. And then the, uh, could you give us an update on the uh, on the Septimus gas flood that you had initiated? Yeah, legs. So uh, legs we finished off uh, last year. Uh, we moved the compressor into an Alberta area where we were looking to do uh, – that, that pilot in there. Um, right now, we've just got it on hold. Um, right now, with the stronger gas pricing uh, and uh, lower liquids prices, it just didn't make sense to carry on with that pilot in that area at this time, as well as we were pres preserving capital. So uh, part of our budget process, we'll look ahead on that one. Uh, you know, with in terms of Septimus, it worked exactly as we felt it would, and uh, so it is another uh, lever we can pull. Uh, in our, for our company here in the future. Okay. Uh, and then just a quick question on the AOSP side. Just with the expansion, is, is there any meaningful change or any change on the uh, on the quality of the upgraded product coming out with the one uh, the expansion volumes? Yeah. So, it, so it's actually in two steps. So the first step is just uh, increasing the front end. So there will be a little more uh, heavy oil uh, uh, coming out of the upgrader uh, after the expansion. And then in 2022, they do another um, part of expansion on the, the, I would say, the back side of the plant, which will give you more SEO. So it's, it's just a two-step uh, process. Um, and of course, we're not the operator, and, uh, but uh, we'll get the first step, the, the front end up, and uh, see what, uh, where we can take that end. And then uh, when they do the next piece in 2022, uh, we'll get more quality SEO. 
Okay. And just a final question on the international side. Just if, we, if you look at the, the five-year strip, just if you think about a $45 to $50 uh, environment, how does the international segment, just given that it's sort of spread around three different areas, how does that fit in to the corporate profile? Um, well, very well. Uh, it, it's a free cash uh, generator. Um, you know, uh, you know that's we've got exploration opportunities in CDI uh, where we could uh, increase production. So, uh, you know, I look at it as uh, just another uh, opportunity that sits in our portfolio that uh, we can exercise uh, when the timing is right. And uh, um, you know, it's uh, if you look at the international operations, I, I believe the number I last saw was almost five billion dollars of free cash flow from those properties over time here since uh, owning it. So. I look at it, uh, it's just a nice, uh, you know, adder to our, our company. Okay. Sounds great. And just finally, what, when can we expect the results from that uh, South African exploration well that, that you're spending next quarter? Uh, well, the operator uh, uh, is moving the rig, and uh, I would expect maybe in Q4 sometime. Uh, okay. Year end, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. As a reminder, to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone. Your next question comes from Mike Dunn from Stiefel First Energy. Thanks. Good morning, uh, folks. Uh, just morning. wondering, uh, gentlemen, um, I didn't see any uh, 2020 production guidance in your disclosures today. Is it? I'm, I'm assuming it's still the case that um, um, as of your press release three months ago, you, you still would be expecting to meet um, at least the low end of your original 2020 production guidance. And I just wanted to clarify if that included uh, specifically for the oil and NGLs uh, guidance as well, or not just the total BOEs. Yeah, the, uh, when we did our uh, annual guidance uh, back in December, uh, it just included all production, uh, so liquids production and uh, uh, gas production. So, uh, you know, on the liquid production at that time, we had, uh, you know, 910 to 970,000 barrels a day as a range, and the gas is 1360 to 1420. So, um, you know, there's really, uh, you know, the way today uh, with the stability of everything, uh, you know, I would say, yes, we'll be within guidance, uh, probably uh, maybe a little over guidance, over on the gas side. Um, but, um, you know, it's uh, as we've seen here over the last few months, uh, with May to minus uh, negative pricing to where we are today, which looks pretty stable. It looks uh, fairly, you know, on track. Thanks, Tim. That's all for me. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Your next question comes from Mino Holsha from TD Securities. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just have uh, one follow-up question on next year's horizon turnaround. Can you just remind us of the scope of the expansion work that the outages, outages uh, tied to? Sure. Uh, there's a couple of items that are being done, but uh, uh, the biggest piece is the East Tank uh, farm. So, so what this does is just gives us extra tankage so that when we go into uh, an outage or have a outage in one of the uh, plants that we're able to store uh, product and then make that product back up. So that's probably the biggest scope uh, that's happening out there. There is additional work that we're doing on some piping. Obviously, we have a very proactive um, integrity program, and we see some some piping that we'd like to replace. And uh, really, you know, that's that's really the major scope of it. And what is the so, uh, capacity of the uh, the new package? Oh, I don't have that number offhand there. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. There are no further questions at this time. I will turn the call back over to the presenters. Thank you, operator, and thank you, everyone, for attending our conference call this morning. Canadian Natural's large, well-diverse asset base continues to drive significant shareholder value. The ability of our teams to deliver effective and efficient operations with top-tier performance is contributing to substantial and sustainable free cash flow throughout the business cycle. This, together with effective capital allocation, contributes to achieving our goal of maximizing shareholder value. If you do have any further questions, please don't hesitate to give us a call. 
Thanks and goodbye.